My name is Bill Kopar, and I run Kopar Honey Farm, which is about three miles from here in Vaughan Township. Uh, it's on the other side of 28. And if you've never been on that side of 28, it's like going out in the Wild Wild West. There's, there's nothing. It's trees. And on this side of 28, it's, uh, it's all houses and developments. Got started with bees about 24, 25 years ago. Uh, we all accentuate our gardens. We had a lot of gardens, and we had probably 300 varieties of perennials in our gardens. And bees do more for plants than fertilizer, fertilizer does. They really, really get plants going because they're there to be pollinated. They do everything to attract bees to get pollinated. And, and quite frankly, it's, with nature, it's all about sex. They need to be pollinated, and they are. They do so much better. Um, we now. People always ask me, how many colonies of bees do you have? And I can't honestly answer that question. We have a lot. I just usually say yes. And uh, I was telling someone earlier, sometimes we have bees in five counties. Uh, right now we've got bees in three counties, and they're mainly on pollination contracts. We've got bees at Trax Farm down in Washington County. We've got bees at Yarnix Farm, another commercial farm in Indiana County. Uh, we've got bees at Staging Yards in Allegheny County. And as people call and, and request bees to, to rent for pollination, we move them there. We tend to keep bees in trailers uh, that go to farms uh, simply because it's a lot easier. Bee colonies are heavy and it's a lot of work. If we keep them in trailers, we're able to move them around a lot easier. The neat thing about bees, and, and there's a couple things I really want to focus on on pollination. I was asked earlier by a reporter, what do I want people to take away from this today? And I think the two most important things I want you to take away from this is not only bees, pollinators in general, we are losing at an absolutely alarming rate. Uh, there are people in this room that I would say are, are my age or older, and you can remember when you were children, there were so many bees you couldn't walk outside with bare feet. Uh, I have four colonies in my front yard, and I have a hard time finding bees in my yard. That's how many billions and billions of bees we have lost. It was all due mainly to pesticides. We use pesticides in this country that are banned in other countries. Um, really, really nasty stuff. If if you like scary movies, look this up tonight. If you don't, wait till wait till daylight. Neo nicanoids. If you start to type in neo, it'll probably pop up. But if you put in neo nicanoid, it is a pesticide that's used that is put in most of the seeds as they're planted, and it grows systemically with the plant. This stuff is so toxic. It's measured in parts per billion. One part per billion is enough to totally upset a bee. And what it does to them, it was it was used back in the 70s for termites, which are another social insect. So you have ants, termites, and bees. Those are social insects. They live in colonies. They, they take care of one another. They can't survive on their own. They can only survive as a colony. And what it does is it kind of gives them a form of Alzheimer's, if you will when they go out to feed they can't remember how to get back to the nest and how it's affecting bees and butterflies and, and all our other native bees is the same way they go out and they can't remember how to come back and it doesn't seem to affect bee colonies all year long because you've got queens there they're laying their own weight in eggs a day a healthy queen bee can lay 1200 eggs a day they constantly lay eggs to take care of the colony and as field bees, you've got, you've got bees in the colony that are there to work in the colony. You've got bees that go out to gather food and water and nectar and pollen and pine pitch and different stuff that they bring back to the colony. And that amounts for about a third of the bees in there. Another third of the bees are, <coughs> are just being born or in larva stages. Another third of the bees are working in the colony. So the bees that we have right now in the summertime, only live about four weeks. They spend two of those weeks in their colony. And the last two weeks of their life is when they're out working. So when you see a bee in your yard, a honeybee in your yard, it's got about two weeks to live. And, and that's it. And you can tell when you look at them if they've just if they've just left the colony and they're out working or if they've been out a while, their wings are starting to get tattered, they start to look a little beat up. And bees are there's so many unique things about honeybees. They're so clean, they make cats look filthy, all right? They're all about hygienics. And when they get to that stage in their life where they're no more use to the colony, 
They don't even come back. They just go, they just go off and die. Sometimes there's mortality in the colony, and there are bees that, at that stage in their life, every couple of days, their their body changes, and they have different jobs. Some of them are just trash trashmen. They take out dead bodies. They get you know fly out with them on a clear day like that. You'll see them flying out. They go out about 80 yards, drop them, and then come back. They take everything away from the colony to keep the colony clean. They can sense diseases in colonies, and they'll dig out larvae and pupa that are diseased. Take them out and get rid of them and clean the whole thing up. They're very efficient keeping themselves clean, but they have no defense against pesticides. Really nasty stuff. To boss away from the bees, but in the, in the same form, a few years ago we were losing a lot of bats in Pennsylvania. They're the only mammal in Pennsylvania on the endangered species list is our bats. We're losing a lot of bats, and they were losing them to a, something called white nose syndrome, which was a perfect situation in the caves and the rookeries that they lived in because of the way the temperature was and allowed this mold, if you will, to form on the bats and it, it killed them when they were in the winter. And when they went into the rookeries, there were dead bats all over the floor of the, of the caves. Now, bats only produce one bat a year. They're not like, like birds that have a nest full of eggs. They produce one a year. So it takes them a while to build back. We're still losing bats at a phenomenal rate, but the difference now is there are no dead bats in the bottom of these rookeries. They're, they're succumbing to the same pesticides that the, that the honeybees are and the other pollinators and all our insects. It's like there's a war on insects in, in this country. And farmers love it because they don't have to deal with this stuff, but it's really affecting our pollinators and at some point it's gonna affect our food supply. I'm gonna cover that in detail. So the bulk of the insects that bats eat are mosquitoes. Bats can eat 1,200 mosquitoes a night. And waterborne insects are affected by these neonicotinoids more than any other insects. So I believe that they're ingesting these and they, they too can't find their way back. It only makes sense uh, because they're, they're no bodies. They're not, they're not there, but they're just not coming back. We're finding birds now, dead birds out in the fields for, for no reason. They're perfectly healthy. It's like something killed them. They're perfectly intact and they're dead. Birds eat insects. These neonics have, have now started to transfer over from target plants to non-target plants. They're finding it in trees, in pollen in trees and other stuff. It's really scary. It's mainly in corn. I say it's affecting us because you would be hard pressed to find a product in a store that doesn't have high fructose corn syrup in it. There are 14 million acres of corn in this country that have this stuff in it. It grows systemically in the plant. And then when it's harvested, this dust goes off and of course it gets into other stuff. It is a serious, serious thing. Monarch butterflies, another pollinator. Whether you're aware of it or not, in North America, that's Canada, all the United States, in the fall, our monarch butterflies, our adult butterflies, fly down, take the jet stream, and they fly down to Mexico. There's a mountain in Mexico where they winter over. And they stay there all winter. In the spring, they migrate back, and they lay eggs and start the whole process all over again. They were appalled. 20 years ago when there were only 40 acres of butterflies. And when I say 40, I mean they're like this far, boom, 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 like, like clothes hanging in your closet next to one until they practically pull the trees down. That's how many there were. There were 40 acres and they were appalled. Last year there were two. This is the way we're losing pollinators. Four more species of bumblebees have become extinct in the last year. I photograph a lot of insects with macro photography and I had some green sweat bees that, are, that live in the ground in my backyard. I was photographing, I want to get them in different stages. In a month's time, they were gone. I had some minor bees that I found, another type of, of bee that we have in Pennsylvania, native bee. They last about the same amount of time, they're gone. They just don't perish on their own. Something, something's causing this problem. So I want to focus on the problem and I want to talk about the food supply. We're going to cover honey, we're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff. I want to talk about the food supply for a minute. Why honeybees are considered to be the perfect pollinator. There are a lot of things that pollinate. The wind pollinates, moths pollinate, butterflies pollinate, bees pollinate, bats pollinate, and some pollinate mainly by accident. When they go into a flower, they're going there to get food. They're going there to get the nectar. Honeybees categorically don't do that. 
they go there too to get the nectar, but they also go there to get the pollen because they take that pollen and they take it back to their colony. If you look at this little observation hive, this single frame hive, I can show you plugs of pollen here. They save that pollen because they feed the pollen to the larva, to the young bee. So they go from an egg to a larva, to a pupa, to an adult. The pollen is so rich in protein, it has five times the protein red meat. Really good stuff, okay? They go to collect pollen. But the really unique thing about honeybees, and why I say they're a perfect pollinator, and I brought some, I have some really nice photographs of them. This is a honeybee on a peach blossom, this is a honeybee on a cucumber. You notice this big orange yellow thing on both their back legs? All right, can everybody see that? It's pollen. It's pollen. Now, bees are an insect and they have six legs. Bees have hair on their entire body. They even have hair on their eyes. So they're a perfect receptor for gathering pollen. And when they go into a flower, they take nectar and they gather that pollen up and they brush it off themselves and they push it to their back legs. Their four front legs are kind of normal insect legs, but the back ones have these really long hairs on them and they can pack that wet pollen on there. It's called a pollen basket. And they're able then to fly back with that one and a stomach full of nectar at the same time. They can fly carrying their own weight that's how efficient they are. They'll fly as far as two miles to get food. And they'll come right back to their colony within six inches. And when they come out, they orientate themselves because remember, they're only out of the colony for two weeks. They're only gonna live for two weeks. And the sun doesn't change enough in the sky in two weeks to affect them. So they, they orientate to that area more accurate than a GPS you could have. And they go out and they come back. If this was a colony of bees and I moved them over to that coat rack, they wouldn't find it. They would come to here. Another reason that bees are perfect pollinators, I, I like to use this example a lot, because at this time of the year you'll see this. You'll see multiple fruit trees growing to, at the same time blooming. So the, the peaches and the, and the pears and cherries happen all about the same time. And you can watch a butterfly. It will go down, and, and to, flowers to a butterfly are a smorgasbord. It's just a food supply. They want nectar. They may go down to a dandelion and try that, and they'll go to a piece of clover, and they'll go up on a, on a, on a pear bloom, maybe to an apple bloom, until they find something that they like and they'll stay with it. Honeybees don't do that. They're single flower pollinators. What I mean by that is, when they come out of their colony in the morning, they all go in different directions. They come back when they're loaded up, and they do this little dance thing. There's ones that are dancing in here right now. They're explaining, they're talking to the other bees, telling them what they found, how good it was, how far it was, what color it was, and by the wiggles and the things that they do, they explain to the other bees where they're going. And whoever can tell the best story that makes it sound the most exciting is where these bees start to go. And they, they get the metric system, because they go 10, then 100, <laughs> then 1,000. They go out there, and you know, colonies this year got about, you know, you're looking at about, right now, they got about 40 to 45,000 bees in these colonies. And so you've got half of those are going out. So you have 20,000 bees out there gathering up food. And they're gonna to go to the best source of, of pollen or nectar or both that they can find. But when they go out, even though they all went different directions, when they go to a flower, if they go to an apple bloom, they will only work on apple blooms on that trip. They won't cross over. There could be a tree right next to the bloom and they will not cross over. And that's really important for pollination because you can't cross pollen. You can't get pollen from a pear and pollinate an apple. It doesn't work that way, all right? So we rent bees to farms and they gladly pay it because depending on what type of farm it is, if it's a vegetable farm, like you see on this cucumber here, vine crops in particular are almost non-existent without bee pollination. You will not get fruit. I have farmers that can tell, they can tell when I bring bees there, when they're not there, just by the way their zucchini comes in, the way it looks, okay? The way it's pollinated. You will not get pollination, you will not get fruit. Vine crops particularly need it. Cucumbers, pumpkins, squash, stuff like that to grow in vines. You have to have bee pollination. It's the type of the flower and the way it is. Uh, apples. It behooves an apple farmer to rent bees. They can double their marketable crop of apples when they use bees. And the reason I say that is, the bees do such a good job of pollinating that they put a spray on when we take the bees away to thin them. 
because if you've got 12 apples per foot, your apples only get this big. They want those nice, big, beautiful apples. And I have to laugh, There's a there was a commercial out there for a, a while for somebody's applesauce. I can't remember who it was. And he talked about these beautiful apples that they use to make applesauce. Nothing could be further from the truth. The apples that get turned into apple juice, applesauce, apple pie, apple whatever, are the ugly apples that they're half apples and they, they look terrible and they're not full fruited. The beautiful, perfect apples are the ones that get waxed and polished and put away that you buy and pay top dollar for in a store. Those are the most marketable apples. That's what the farmer makes money on. The other ones might pay for the fertilizer in the spring, but that's where they make their profit. And how that happens is very simple. We have about 2,200 varieties of apples in this country. There's about 200 of them that are commercial that you commonly see in stores. You can think of the common ones like feet, you know, your favorites, the Fiji's, the Honey Crisp, the, the Red Delicious, the Yellow Delicious, the Granny Smith's, you know, the common apples, all right? But there are a lot more than that. Any apple that you take, if you cut it this way, instead of with the core, and you look at the end of it, you see they're gonna have five or seven seeds in it. That's because on the flower, there are either five or seven receptors, female receptors on that. And it's about the seed. It's about reproduction. Everything in nature is about reproduction. The flower is doing everything in its power to attract those bees. It's putting on a scent. It's got a food source for it. It's got nectar. It wants that pollen to get things pollinated. So we'll take that apple. Let's say it's a seven seed apple and a butterfly comes to it. The wind could pollinate it, okay? Not apple stuff. I'm, I'm gonna cover that and I'm gonna get back to this. There are two types of flowers. There are flowers where the anthers, which is the male part that the pollen is, are way above the female part of the flower. The wind is enough to knock that pollen into there and to pollinate that. Those are things like wheat, most of our grasses, corn, okay? You don't need bees for that. Where you have a problem is when the female part is higher than the male part, you have to physically move that pollen to where it needs to go. That's where bees come in, all right? So we're back to this seven seed apple. If a butterfly gets in there and it happens to pollinate two or three of them by accident, by June, they call it a June drop. By June, the tree is likely gonna call that apple. It is gonna fall off because the tree is not gonna put energy into that producing fruit. The fruit is produced for the seed, is to protect the seed. I like to think of it in terms of a woman who's pregnant in the water that protects the baby, the fruit protects the seed. It's all about the, the fruit and about the seed. If the seed isn't pollinated, it will not, it will not put fruit around it, okay? And those are those half, you never see these, but those are those half apples and those deformed apples that can turn into apple juice and applesauce and all that other stuff, okay? It likely is gonna, the tree's just gonna drop it. If it has half of them pollinated, it'll likely keep the fruit but it'll be deformed. It won't be perfect. When we get those perfect ones, every one of those receptors will be pollinated and made a perfect piece of fruit. And that's what the farmer's after because that's the high dollar apple. So nobody buys the ugly apples. That's just the way it is. There's nothing wrong with them. This is not complete fruit. The tree produces the fruit around the seed so that it's consumed, not like people who throw the cord away, but by animals that would eat it, deposit it in the woods and another apple tree grows. That's the way it's supposed to happen. But you don't have that if you don't have a seed. So that is where that comes in. Why honeybees are a perfect pollinator? For several reasons. We talked about they have hair all over the body. They're single flower pollinators, okay? But the wildest thing about honeybees, we could talk, I'm telling you, my wife's back here shaking her head, we talked about honeybees for the next 10 hours, and I would never run out of stuff to tell you about them, and you'd be glued to your seat, and you'd be like, how does this guy keep all this in his head? Bees are the most fascinating insect on planet Earth, bar none. We've been keeping them forever. They, they, they show records back to 15,000 BC of having bees, okay? Uh, honey is, is a unique food. We're gonna get into that in a little bit too. But the, one of the main reasons why they're so unique, if you were to take a box of butterflies or a box of bumblebees or a box of, pick any pollinator and take them somewhere to pollinate, they would go out, do their thing, and you'd never see them again. I can haul honeybees anywhere. 
I haul them at night. Everybody's home. I don't have to worry about losing anybody. They're all home. I can haul them wherever I need to take them, pop the screens off, and in the morning they come out. I may have drove them for two hours. They get out, they fly in a little circle, they know where they are, boom, they go do their job and they come right back in. You can't do that with other pollinators. In the month of February, one third of the bees in the entire United States are sitting in the state of California for one reason and one reason only, to pollinate almonds. Without bees, you don't have almonds. They are stripped by tractor trailer. You can fit 408 colonies on a tractor trailer. And they pay big bucks to get them. They make more in a month in California on almonds. And I can make an entire season of pollination here. It is that important for almonds. You do not have almonds and you don't have bees. I have a picture here somewhere. Oh, this is an almond field in California. And what you see here are 16 boxes of bees. They came by tractor trailer and were unloaded with a fork truck. And they'll come out in the morning and they'll pollinate and they'll They'll be there, and, and beekeepers love it because their bees come back fat and happy. They've been, they're not in a cold winter here, they're in nice warm California in a Mediterranean environment, pollinating something, getting food, and getting a jump on everybody else. All right. I talked about vine crops, they show in here cantaloupes, uh, all kind of other stuff, but mainly about the almonds. So, a typical route, you may have. You're an enormous commercial beekeeper and you're moving bees all over the country because that's where you make your money. I always say people think there's money in honey or bad at math. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot of work and it just isn't there. Okay. You may start in Florida in the winter and pollinate citrus. And then if you're going up the East Coast, you may move bees up into the Carolinas for blueberries and apples. And when that's done, you may move them up into Pennsylvania and New York for apples and move them over to New Jersey for blueberries. Then you may move them up to the cranberry bogs in Massachusetts out in the swamps to pollinate so they have cranberries. If you're working off the West Coast, you may be working out of California, you're gonna, you're gonna work all the stuff in California throughout the winter, and then you're gonna move bees out into the, out in the Midwest or maybe up into Montana uh, for wildflowers or sunflowers. But the thing that people never think about with bees are seed production. You go to the store, you buy seeds, they have to come from somewhere. There are farms that are dedicated just to making seeds. And we talked about if they're not pollinated, they don't work. They send bees just for seed production. Okay. They may go out to alfalfa fields to pollinate alfalfa that we feed our, our cattle. And it has been said that bees pollinate one third of all the food that we eat. And I say that number is wrong. I'm going to do my best to prove that to you in a minute and show you how important bees are for our, for our life and what we eat and what we do. Um, we have, I venture to say most of the people in here, are, or my age, are close. You can remember back in the day, there's this little known company called McDonald's that came out with this hamburger called the Big Mac. And they had this little ditty, and it went, to all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, all on a sesame seed bun. We're gonna put that one third food thing to the test here. I need two volunteers, and I'm not gonna make you say anything or do anything, I just want you to be able to, if you can count to 10, so you got to be able to I have two people who can count for me. Oh, come on. Okay, he's gonna count, you're gonna count. I'm gonna have you count everything that, that the bees pollinate, I'm gonna have you count everything that the bees don't pollinate, okay? And I'll, I'll just I'll point to you, and you can go, you know, however you want to go. To all beef patties. So do they pollinate the do they pollinate the cow? Yes. They do, because they pollinated everything from the alfalfa to the, whatever they're where they're eating. Okay, so they did. They get half credit for that. They get one half credit. So you can get, you gotta kind of have, we're gonna get you another half later. So you're good. <laughs> you have a half. Special sauce. Nobody knows what special sauce is. We're just going to take it out of the equation. It's special. We're going to get rid of it. To all beef fatty special sauce, lettuce. Do they pollinate lettuce? Absolutely. So you've got one and a half. To all beef special sauce, lettuce, cheese. Well, they don't pollinate cheese and they don't pollinate the cow, but the food that they got it from. So there's your other half for the cheese. Pickles come from cucumbers. Yes. Get one for that. Cheese, pickles, onions. Absolutely. There's ketchup in that meal from tomatoes. Absolutely. Okay. Sesame seeds. 
Absolutely. The bun is wheat. That gets enough. Nothing for the bun. Okay. She's killing me. We have, <laughs> we have French fries. We have French fries in that meal that come from potatoes. So you get another one for the potatoes. And we have a soft drink. You get nothing but a soft drink. So you get one of those. So we had all beef patties, no special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, sesame seed, sesame seed bun. bun, sesame seeds, Coke, and potatoes. There's nine. How many did you have? Two. Two. How many did you have? Seven. Seven out of nine is more than one third. And that is not a good meal. There were no fruits and vegetables in there. Well, there were fruit because there was tomatoes, but there's no vegetables in there. Okay? There's no nuts. There's the stuff that they really need. So it's really more than a third. Now, Einstein, my favorite physicist, once said that without the honeybees, we have but four years to live. He's a phenomenal physicist, but he doesn't know anything about bees and pollination. We would not die, but I can assure you, you would not like the diet. It, it's what we call grave food. Those are things that only the wind can pollinate. Okay? It's a really, really ugly thing. But you don't have fresh fruits and vegetables and meats and all this other stuff that we really enjoy in life. So it would be, it would be a sad state of affairs. Uh, we can move bees. They're covered in hair. They're perfect pollinators. They, they do it all. If I can get off the bees for a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about honey. I brought some samples of honey, and I brought a chart. There were about 200 individual floras of honey. What I mean by that is it's a single flower source. Stuff we have in the back we call wildflower honey because it's a mix. We're bought out of our specialty honeys, but it's a mix of honey. So it's a spring mix of different stuff. It's a fall mix of different stuff. But I have some that are single flora sources up here. Honey is unique. It is like wine. <coughs> they all smell a little different. They all taste a little different. They all look a little different. And these are some of the most common ones in the country. The lightest one, we actually have some here. I got it from somebody because we don't have any here. It's fireweed. If you've ever been out west after a wildfire, we were in Glacier, Montana after 110,000 acres burned out there. And the first thing that comes up is fireweed. It's a beautiful pink flower. It gets about that tall. You can't, can't keep the bees off it. Of course, there's nothing else. Everything's burnt to the ground. And they go to it and it makes this water white honey. I mean, light. Well, I mean, it's beautiful honey. Okay, it's not water in there. Okay? See how easy that moves? See how light it is? Okay. Really cool stuff. Clover honey, buckwheat honey, we have some buckwheat here. Orange blossom, now, here's the thing about honey. Orange blossom does not taste anything like oranges. <laughs> and blueberry honey doesn't taste anything. If it does, someone's adulterated it and put some kind of oils in it, okay? It doesn't taste like those things. They all have unique taste though. They taste very unique. And I brought a light with me to show you a couple of things. So, this is very similar, it, honey darkens with time. This is very similar to, uh, the honey we have in the back back there, and you see the light goes through it very easily. And something you need, this is kind of neat. There's a reason that all the jars of everything you buy in a store around and why honey jars are shaped like this. It's a marketing trick. Because people believe in their mind, it's like brown eggs, white eggs. They believe that lighter honey is better. Nothing could be further from the truth. The darker the honey is, the more antioxidants it has in it, and the more flavor it usually has in it, okay? If this jar was round, that honey would be a lot, it would look like this, it would be a lot darker. But because it's flat like that, light passes through it easier and makes it look lighter. So it's like, it's a consumer trick. They've been doing it for a long time. This is a blueberry honey, okay? One of these, they're so similar, I can't tell anymore. One of these should be red. Is that red? Yep. That's the evil Japanese knotweed that we have that grows around here. It's so invasive. Bees love it. The only thing you like better than that is poison ivy. You, you go up in Harrison Hills Park, they've got poison ivy vines. I'm not kidding you, as big around as my leg. They are strangling. They're chilling on the tops of those trees. Yeah. But when that stuff's blooming, you can hear just buzzing with bees. They love it. They absolutely love it all over. This is buckwheat honey. It is so thick and so dark, it won't even let light pass through it. It's like a dark, it's like a black hole. It won't, even let, it won't even let light come through. It's that thick. And these honeys are a little thicker. See how long it's taking that bubble to get up there? It just hit the top. And if you had five minutes, you could get this to go to the top. It's like tar, very thick. 
I don't particularly care for it. It tastes a lot like molasses, and I'm not a big molasses fan. Um, my favorite honeys are, and I have, have traded with a friend of mine. I give him Japanese knotweed because he doesn't have any. And it, I get orange blossom. I get like five gallons of it. I like orange blossom honey. My wife likes the real light locust honey, and I do like the Japanese knotweed. They're, you know, they do different stuff with different honeys. So honey is the only food known to man. Where'd that clock disappear? Since I didn't turn my head. There's okay. six it's the only food known to man that doesn't spoil. That's right. Okay. Mm. It's a pre-digested sugar. The bees have already ingested it, barfed it up, and put it in cells. Yes, yeah, bee puke. Okay. <clears throat> Wonderful stuff, but it's pre-digested. All the junk is out of it. You can eat honey and never go to the bathroom. Your body totally uses all of it up. That's why of all the foods out there, bees choose honey to store, right? It has properties in it that, that will not allow bacteria that we know of to live for more than two days in it. We're gonna cover that in a little more detail. But the bees live off of honey because in the wintertime, they consume honey. A colony in, in Western Pennsylvania is gonna use about 60 pounds of honey over the course of the winter. They stay in a cluster, they cluster when it gets below 50 degrees. And the colder it gets, the tighter that cluster gets. I've seen bees that are clustered this big turn into a cluster, believe it or not, they'll get that tight when it's down at zero. They get as tight as they can to keep as much heat preserved in there, and they eat honey as they go through the colony to stay alive in the winter. That's how they stay alive, that's how they make heat. The way they make heat is they get a really unique again. They have muscles that were like hooks where our shoulder blades are, that they can disconnect from their wings and they move those muscles, that's the buzzing sound that you hear, they move those muscles, it's not the wind beat, it's the buzz, it's those muscles. It's like your heart, your heart's not beating, it's the muscles, it's, it's the opening, closing the valve is what you hear. You hear those muscles moving and making that noise and they can, they can move those muscles without their wings moving and it produces friction and makes heat. And they don't all do it, they sporadically do it throughout that cluster to keep that cluster 54 degrees all winter long, right where they are. In their brood nest, when the queen starts to lay eggs in January, it starts out small, and right now it's peaking. They keep at a perfect 92 <coughs> degrees. Not 93, not 91, the exact temperature. That's the way it stays. It's a nursery. They keep it exactly that temperature to raise those young to keep them right. But we don't go into colonies when it's too cold. We don't want to chill. We want to keep them just the way they are. <coughs> All right. So they take that same honey and they eat it because now it's been pre-digested. They don't have to go to the bathroom because they have to fly to defecate. They can't fly in the winter. We get, in a normal winter, five or six warm-ups where it gets warm enough for bees to fly. We call it a cleansing flight. You go out and the snow is all spotted with bee poop, all right? They will not, they'll die before they'll go in that, in that hive. And sometimes they do. Sometimes if it's cold long enough, they'll literally explode and then the whole colony gets dysentery. They call it an ozema when bees get it, but they get dysentery and they are miserable. I mean, imagine being stuck in there with 40,000 of your best friends who all got the squirts. It is not a good situation, you know? So they eat honey because they don't, they don't need to go to the bathroom. So it's a perfect thing for them. It's the only food known to man that doesn't spoil. Bacteria can't live in it. The reason bacteria can't live in it, I could open up one of these jars, cough in there, close it up, and you'd be, you wouldn't find anything alive in there in two days. Bacteria, just like human beings, are more than 70% water. Honey is hyperscopic, which means it has the ability to pull moisture from something if it's dry, or give moisture back if the environment is drier than it is. So if we were in Arizona, and typically all the honey we, we have here, we keep it about 16% moisture content. That's where the bees keep it. If it gets much above 19%, it'll ferment. It turns into a natural alcoholic beverage called mead. Right, it will ferment on its own. We don't like that. So we, we test it, we make sure that it's low where it should be. We, ours is about 16%, but if we were in Arizona where they get really low humidity, we were opening up a jar of honey out there, at the end of the day, it would be drier than 16%. Here, where our relative humidity on average for the year is 50%, if we were to open it up at the end of the day, it would be wetter inside. Okay, it, it's hyperscopic. It can pull moisture and give moisture back, and that's why it's so good for baking, because things don't get stale. It works really well, right? They will take the pollen, which is very, very, very perishable. It doesn't last long. 
they bring that pollen back and they coat it in honey. It's called bee bread. And they stack it in the cells because the honey protects it and keeps it from getting any bacteria on so they can use it. They will store a lot of pollen over the winter to when they start their nest up, they can't go out and get it to feed their to feed their young. And that's what they do with that, with that pollen. So a little bit more about honey. This solid rock is honey, and this semi rock, some of it's solid and some of it's liquid, is also honey. And the reason for that is that's normal. That's the way honey is supposed to be. This honey is raw. This honey is not processed. The reason honey is processed, when you buy store honey that is processed, it doesn't need to be pasteurized. There's nothing to kill it. Okay, you don't need to, since it's pasteurized, they don't even know what you're talking about. You can't pasteurize honey. You would totally destroy it, okay? Real honey has small amounts. Sometimes it's even big pollen. You can actually see it, but pollen in it. Pollen is the bulk of the flavor. It is absolutely all the protein, because it's a solid carbohydrate. That's the only protein you're getting out of it. It's the most, most of the flavor that you're getting out of the honey is coming from that pollen. And if you can remember, I did this in about the fourth or fifth grade. If, if you did this in, some, in science class, you would take water, a beaker, and put sugar in it, keep stirring it until it wouldn't take any more sugar. Okay, it's called a super saturated solution, and that's exactly what honey is. Because they've taken that nectar and they keep taking the water out until it's, it's, it's saturated with, with sugar, that's what it is. And you would put a string in it, hang it off a pencil, put a string on it, and crystals would start to form on it. You'd fill the thing with crystals. Did anybody in here ever do that? Really? Oh, we did a lot of that. But you, you can try it, you can do it. If you buy real maple syrup, it'll crystallize right in the container. We have some beautiful crystals at home. We've got out of maple syrup. They're god awful big things. I mean, really nice looking crystals. And all it is is a, is a super saturated solution. But the string in the sugar water is a catalyst that starts the crystallization. The pollen in the honey is what starts the crystallization. So, rather than, because you're all stupid, rather than explaining to the public, it's real easy. You take the honey that doesn't need refrigerated, and you'll warm it up to its natural temperature in 96 degrees, and everything turns back to liquid. No, that's too difficult. They take the honey in a superheated, to unbelievable temperature, which destroys it nutritionally, takes the flavor out of it, and they force it through finer and finer and finer filters, diatomaceous earth, clay, to pull all the pollen out of it so it can't crystallize. You can take store-bought honey and it can sit on a shelf forever and it doesn't crystallize. You could probably even put it in a refrigerator and it crystallize. Some honeys take years to crystallize. Some honeys like, um, help me here, Jennifer, what's the one in the fall I hate it? Uh, asters. Aster honey, Will, will crystallize in days. Best you put in dark, but it's hard as a rock. I try to leave that for the bees. They can deal with it a lot better than I can, because I can't keep it liquid, okay? People are always, you know, chunking it out of it. That's why honey is processed, because it's too hard to explain to people how to, how to take care of it. All you need to do is warm it up. A day like today, you could put it on a dash of your car outside, and it would be totally liquid when you come back. I take five gallon buckets, and overnight, I keep it at 96 degrees, I have a, a warmer. Turns into total liquid, and I put them in a bottling tank, and I bottle them from that. That's how you take care of the honey. Bees fly 55,000 miles and visit as many as 2 million flowers to make one pound of honey. Damn. Think about that. Busy bee. 55,000 miles and as many as 2 I say as many as because they prefer the little flowers. Two million flowers make one pound of honey. In its entire lifetime, a bee can only produce a 12th of a teaspoon of honey. A colony is going to travel about five and a half million miles. I don't have them frequent flyer miles. <laughs> five and a half million miles in a season to produce enough honey to keep themselves alive and to have excess honey. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. I brought a couple, we're getting short on time. It's amazing how fast time goes when you talk about bees. I want to get into some other stuff before we get into questions. Um, I want to show you the tools that I use. This is pollen. You know, you're welcome to look at this something to me like this is pollen. And this is comb. I'll pass this around. This is, I took this out of a hive the other day. Notice that every cell is the exact same size. 
for years and years and years, scientists thought that the strongest geometric shape on Earth was a triangle. They've come to discover the bees had it right all along. It's a hexagon. It's a six-sided. And that's what they make, six-sided cells. They're, those cells are used for everything from rearing young, to storing pollen, to storing honey. Okay? It's, it's, it's a house with walls. It, it, it's a refrigerator. And it's the nursery. And it's everything that they need. And they make that wax from glands in their body. It takes about seven pounds of honey for them to make a pound of wax. They make that. They excrete it from their bodies. And they form it with their mandibles. And they're perfect. And you can look at these things under a microscope. They're perfect. Everyone is exactly the same. So when the queen comes into this, it's really neat. She drops her abdomen down inside of there. And she feels how wide the cell is. If it's wide like those, those are drone cells. She's going to produce drones. Those are male bees. Those are, those are the few male bees that we have. In a colony of 50,000 bees, there may be 100 drones. The rest are all infertile females and one fertilized female who's a queen. Okay? But so Alexander said, oh, this is a drone cell. I'm going to lay an unfertilized egg in here. She lays an egg in there. For two days, it's standing up. The third day, it lays down. It half just turns into a larva. They feed them royal jelly for four days. And they feed them a mixture of royal jelly and pollen unless they're going to be a queen, and they feed royal jelly the entire time, all right? The, uh, the queen also, if she's going to lay females, she feels that cell, so this is a female cell. She passes that egg through part of her body called a spermaceti, which all the, which all the semen is, is kept in her body, and all you can just help, hold that thing. Fertilizes the egg and puts it in the cell, and then it's a female. They can control the sex of the young when they're doing it. They are mated one time in their life, and that semen, you know, human semen lives 24 hours. Theirs lives for years. I've had queens that are seven years old, viable semen. They're able to fertilize eggs and do everything that they need to do in that amount of time, more than they could ever use. They lay about 1,200 eggs a day. They're, they're absolutely incredible, incredible insects. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? They see colors. They can't see red, although I have red bee boxes. They have no trouble finding them. Okay. They see green really well. They see yellow really well. They see white, and they see blue really well. They see symbols, and they understand symbols. I put geometric symbols on boxes sometimes if they're the same color, triangles, circles, diamonds, crosses. They understand that because when I'm mating queens, they fly out one time. They have to get mated and come back. to exact, They go to a different colony. They're going to kill it. They come back to the exact same colony. Things, things work out really well. Okay. You can move them wherever you need to move them. If I need to move bees from here to the school, we're either going to move them a foot a day so they can find a colony, or I'm going to move them out three miles so they don't know where they are, wait two weeks to all those bees that knew where they were are now dead, and then I move them over to the school and everything's good the next day. They're so focused on that spot and what they do. I brought some bleak bees for you to play with, but I really like it when it's kids. We don't, we don't have any kids in here. I brought a whole bunch of a whole bunch of bees in here loose. I was gonna let the kids play with. And uh, you know, usually they say, oh, oh, they're fuzzy and they tickle. And they are fuzzy, they aren't tickled. And people get all bent out of shape because they're bees. You know, all the other bees. They're not hornets. Hornets are mean invisible. Bees are really cool, and if they sting you, they die. So they really don't want to sting you. If a bee stings you, they leave a stinger in you. And it hurts a little bit. Uh, you may get a little red welt. Normal for you, your whole arm might swell up as big as your leg. That may be normal for you. But if you get stung in your arm and other parts start to swell up, then you've got problems. Then you've, you've probably got allergies. Okay, That's something to be seriously concerned about. I mean, uh, there's no doubt if you're going to get a you're going to die. I've been there. Okay, It's a bad deal. You don't want to, you don't want to go there. Uh, other colors they see. They have, actually on their forehead, they have three pips on their forehead. I can't remember if the triangle is upside down or right side up. I think it's right side up. And with that, they see ultraviolet light. That's what guides them, is ultraviolet light. They'll fly in nearly dark conditions. And when they come out of a colony in the wintertime to take those cleansing flights, if there is snow on the ground and the sun is out, down looks brighter than up. And they'll, go in, they'll keep going into the snow until they mess up the snow enough that they figure, the other ones figure out and they, and they go.
go the way they should. The ultraviolet controls everything for them. They see everything in ultraviolet. They don't see other colors, but ultraviolet is really what drives them. Anybody keeping bees without one of these is crazy. <laughs> uh, I do it sometimes. Yeah, I know my limitations. You know, sometimes I get down there and I'm, I'm sorry I did it. You gotta have a veil. You gotta have a hive tool. It, it pries and scrapes and does everything because they, they propolize those boxes practically shut and it's hard to move stuff. Yeah, it's a smoker. And you gotta have a smoker. Okay. Who has seen the bee movie? One first, it's hysterical. See, if you're beekeeper, it's really funny because it's mainly baloney, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. They make this thing out to be like thermonuclear. Okay, <laughs> this most evil thing of a be evil beekeeper's got this smoker. Smokers are really whoever came up with a smoker. It's really cool. We have hormones. Bees have pheromones. Everything that works up a bee comes from what they smell. And they've got they've got a sense of smell probably ten times better than a dog. I mean, they're using bees to find landmines. They're using bees to find explosives. Bees are really talented. The problem is they only live two weeks after they're out. That's the problem, okay? So when you open up a colony of bees, unlike if they were hornets, they don't all come out at you. A couple may come out, but they start to send off this pheromone, this alarm pheromone, like, hey, some big goof just took the roof off the house. I don't know what he's doing, but uh, <laughs> hey, you know, they'll start letting everybody know. Well, if you just let that continue, they send enough pheromones out that everybody gets a little excited and then they start to come up. Remember, they're going to die if they sting and they really don't want to sting. In fact, bees, I always say they're smarter than people. If you get near a bee's nest, or even sometimes you get a hornet that won't sting you, they'll warn you. Not usually, but they'll, they'll warn you. They'll fly at your head. They under, you know, we understand that the working end of a bee is on this end and the working end of a person is on this end. All right? They will come at your head. That's your warning. And it's like get hotter, hotter, colder, colder. If that chair is a colony and I don't know it's there and I keep walking towards it, now they're gonna hit me in the head. They will literally hit you in the head. And as you get closer to them, they're gonna hit you harder and faster and harder. And when that happens, start to retreat. You go back the other way, you're usually pretty good. They're not gonna hit you in the head anymore and you're going in the right direction, everything's cold. If you continue, they're probably gonna sting you and they're gonna go for your head more times than not. Hornets tend to get arms and legs they because they're they're low and they, they don't care. They just, they're just coming as soon as they come out, they're at you. They don't, they don't mess around. But um, you want to, you know, be cautious about bees and what, you know, they will they will warn you before you get in a bad situation with them. There's something else I want to touch on before we, uh, oh, our employee of the month. We took, everybody's got their employee of the month. This was our employee of the month. We don't know where the name was. She's already dead. <laughs> but, but we took a picture of her. This was, this was on, uh, that was on some uh, pear blossoms. That was our employee of the month. She was, she was out there just working her little tail off. That is a five banded Italian honeybee. Cool. Really good looking girl there. Okay, so the smoker thing. That's where I was going with the smoker thing. When you put smoke down on bees, it does two things. And I have this analogy I use with dogs, and I think it, with kids, they, they really get it. It puts that layer of smoke down and it breaks up that pheromone, that alarm that something's wrong. It's like a fire alarm going off in a building. It's like, hey, roof's off the house. I don't know what's going on. There's light in here. We need to fix this, okay? The smoke calms everything down because they can't smell the other pheromones. So, well, they're not excited. Why should I be? And everything calms down. The other thing that the fire, that the smoker does is it creates in the mind of a bee that there's a fire. And bees are like the Keebler elves. In a normal situation, they live in a hollow tree. If you got a fire, you got a problem. So what they do is they immediately stop feeding the queen. They shut her down. She's laying her own weight in eggs a day. And the only time she's ever flown in her life is when she went out to get mated. And she's big. And flying is a difficult thing. They get her to keep popping eggs. They don't feed her. They're emptying her out because if they have to fly, they need her. And the other thing they need is they need honey because they need honey to make wax. And if things get bad enough, they're gonna go. It's almost like when bees swarm. They gotta go. They gotta get out of that situation. They'll find another place and they'll start making comb and they'll get set up and things will work out. So they start eating honey. So I hit them with a little bit of smoke. They forget about me. They're down there eating honey. I do what I gotta do. I 
put it on. As long as it's not windy. If it's windy, I might have to hit a little more smoke on them, blows it away, and they start getting a little frisky. A little bit more, it calms them right down. Do what I'm going to do, close it back up, go to the next box. It works great. Whoever come up with that thing, oh, fantastic. But in the movie, oh, you got to see the movie. It's hysterical. It's not too factual, but it's hysterical. I mean, for beekeeper, we were like, my wife and I laughed and we cried watching the movie. It's a kid's movie. I just see it. It's really, really funny. Okay, I want to talk real quickly about queens and swarms, and then we're going to go into questions. So everybody, in every lecture I've been to, always ask me about swarms and bees and why they do it. I said in the beginning, it's nature, it's all about sex. Okay. Bees swarm because they're reproducing a column. It's like you dividing tulip bulbs in your yard. Take a bulb, you split them in half, and you got two, and now you got two tools. Next year you got four. And that's how it works, okay? But what bees do is, is things get crowded, and the pheromones get, it's this time of the year. It's mid-April till, you know, any, all bets are off so it is anymore, but usually till, till the end of May. They're swarming, they're swarming now. I've been picking up swarms every couple days. Is it becomes a crowded situation, and they make what's called a queen cup. It's different than these cells. These cells are internal, this thing's external. And the queen goes right along with it. She lays an egg in there. In fact, there's probably going to be about 10 of them in there. When you look at a colony of bees, when you really look at them, most people look at them and they see, I see bees. When I see bees, I see wider and narrower bands, darker and lighter, different colors, this and that. They're all half sisters. They've all got the same mother, but they've all got different fathers. And there's, because she's probably made with 10 to 12 drums. So they're like little roving gangs. There's a gang of a couple thousand here and a couple thousand there and a couple, and they're all sisters. They're all full sisters. They're all the same parents, but they're half sisters to the other ones. Crazy as it sounds, they want their sister to be the, the, the queen. So they build these little cells for her to lay in, and they protect them, and they nurture them, and they put everything in them to get them to hatch. The first queen out wins. They pipe, they make this little sound of it. You can hear them right before they hatch, they're doing that. They do that even when they're adults for a little while. When they hatch, they, they chew their way out. Mission one is they go to kill those other queens, because there's only be one queen in that colony. Or you got serious problems. If they, if a couple of them hatch at the same time, they may fight to the death and, and kill each other, and then they're going to they wreck, they're going to start all over again. So let's, let's have a perfect situation where this group of sisters got their queen hatched, and she knocked off all, all the other queens. And they, and they go along with it. They understand that that's the way it is. In fact, once it's done, they usually go along and even help destroy them. They hang in a perfect situation. They hang on until this we get good weather and she goes off in a couple days and she spills up her strength. She flies off to a drone conjugation area, gets mated with 10 to 13 drones, comes back to the colony. If a blue jay doesn't eat her on the way back, she's back in the colony. And now you got two queens in the colony. you got a mother queen and a daughter queen. And things start to happen. You get all the bees that are in that stage of their life with their wax producers. They gorge themselves with honey. And half of that colony leaves with that old queen. Now they've got a place in mind where they want to go. It may be two miles away, maybe a hundred yards away. They've got a place they want to go. It might be your mailbox. It might be who knows, a hole in your wall that you should have sealed a long time ago and you didn't. And they found it. There's a cavity. And they're going to go there. When they get there, they start to produce wax. They make comb, just like this, and they start with the egg laying and the honey gathering and the nectar gathering and everything they need to gather to do in their new colony. After a short period of time, they kill her. They have her lay eggs for another queen. They kill her and start with a newer, younger queen. They always have to have younger queens to keep it's the healthiest thing for that colony. It's like you have the, you have the house, the parents leave and leave the, the house to the kids. So the new queen is there with what was left, and she starts, and everything's already there. Everything's good to go, and they, they keep the calling. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way it happens most of the time. But what usually happens is they know where they want to go. But they come out, 30,000 bees come roaring out. I watched, I watched one two days ago. I, I could hear them. I said, oh, there's a swarm coming. And they were pouring out of this box. I mean, just pouring out. They were one direction. They weren't coming and going. They were all going. They were coming out. And half of them come out. And the air's filled with them. It's, it's 
it's amazing. It's like being in a snow globe. You just keep your lips clamped like this, and you walk. And I, I've only done it once. I try to find that queen. If I can see that queen flying around, I grab her and I just hold on, and they're all going to land on my arm. And all you do is walk over to a box and knock them all and release her, and they're in there. And usually, what they do is they land on a tree because she hasn't flown for a long time, at least a year, and she can't make the whole trip. So she lands, and they all land with her, and they're hanging there in a the gob. Just hanging there in a the gob. Gobble bees. And I took a picture of one the other day. I should have it right here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. <coughs> That's what the swarm bees look like. Okay. They're totally harmless. They're totally harmless. They're so filled with honey, they couldn't sting you if they wanted to. They can't bend their abdomen because they're totally stuffed with honey. Okay, that's uh, that's seventeen thousand bees. Okay, yeah, we'll put it. Okay. I'll give it to you, and you can put it in front of that. Yeah, that's cool though. Okay. <clears throat> wow. So that's what that's what it looks like when they're when they're stuck somewhere. Now they may break off from that and eventually get to where they're going to be taking a couple days to get to where they're going. That's when they become a problem. Now they've used up all their honey stores. Now they can bend their abdomens, and now they're starting to get frisky. Uh, I was real smart one day because I'm a professional. And I went out to a guy and said, hey, I got a swarm of bees out in my apple tree. And I went out there. They were hanging on a limb. And I set a box underneath it. And I walked out to a pair of shorts, a short t-shirt on it. I usually get my hand like a knife and I go, Zip! and they fall in a box. Well, when I went halfway and hit something, I knew I was in trouble because they had come started. They were already been there for a while. And they weren't a swarm anymore. They were a colony. And oh, my. That guy to this day is probably still laughing, watching me run into my truck, pulling stingers out of my ears while I got into the truck and got away from it. It happens, I should know better. But more times than not, you just bang when they fall right in the box. Or I set a box down and move a cup in, and like little soldiers, they just walk right in. It takes an hour, so they all walk in. I did that earlier this week. I had some in a tree, they were in a tough place, I just pushed it up against the tree, got a few started, and I even watched the queen walk right in. I said, oh, they're in there to stay now. And that's that. We've used up an hour, believe it or not. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned about the nicanoids. Is is that the correct? Neonicanoids, nicanoids, yes. Um, Montsero and Bearer, large, I believe, or companies. I think they I think they've since merged, but yeah, they they're pretty much a producer of those things. Yeah. And they'll tell you they're safe. Have we made headway with uh, politicians or authorities? The, to the question is, is we made up. headway with that? And the answer to that is no. And, some European countries have banned these things. Yes. Um, at the risk of getting political, whether you liked the man or didn't like the man, uh, I believe President Obama, when we left office, he signed off total impunity for these companies. They can't even be sued. That's bullshit. This is this is you know this is serious stuff. Um, you know, I, I don't know you know what changed hands, money, or what happened there, but this is something that needs addressing. It, it is our food, and we lose these pollinators. We we are in a serious serious hurt. And um, I, well, I, I don't know where they get the food from. Is, is there any type of a, a significant movement toward eliminating that? Or yes, there's the, bees. Bees. the only people that seem to be aware of it, a lot of them aren't even aware of are beekeepers. Um, I talk to beekeepers all around the country. Um, I'm pretty well connected that way. I ran into a woman in New York last fall, and she's all over the neonic thing. And she's, she's getting groups together, and they're trying to, they're trying to make it more aware. Um, I would like to see a class action lawsuit filed by every beekeeper in North America, not for the money, but to draw attention to it Thank you. so we can get this thing fixed. I mean, we're working on it. It's slow. Um, the problem is it's just like education. People don't understand. But if you look up neonicanoids, it will scare you to death. Um, the Valley News had me 15 years ago talking about neonicanoids. We, did a, we took two hours of video and condensed it down to about a seven-minute thing. And uh, I was talking about neonics then. The other thing is, you know, you talk about killing bees, there's this thing called colony collapse disorder. It's a fantasy. There is no such thing. It, it's smoke and mirrors to draw attention away from these neonics. That is what's killing our bees, not, not this fantasy virus that they can't isolate. It doesn't exist, it never existed. And it, it, it's a shame, you know, the, the wool we pull over the public's eyes on the stuff. Bad stuff. Good question. Any other questions? 
No, I just have a comment. I buy your honey at Starks all the time. Oh. I'm a regular customer. Stark sells it at cost. I mean, they're you know they're phenomenal to deal with. I love it. I, yeah. I can use it like crazy. Yeah. Any questions? I'm not that good. You have to have some questions. We could have talked about bees till tomorrow morning yeah. and, and not even scratch the surface. Uh, there's so much to do, talk about with them. Okay. Yes. So there are different like varieties or breeds or Races. whatever you want to call them of honeybees, right? Races, how, yeah. how many do you have? I have mainly hybrids. I like I per personally like uh, a lot of the European honeybees. Uh, mm. I like Caucasians. I like um, Cornolians. These are dark bees that come from the Russian mountains. They think our winters are like Florida. Okay. Uh, <laughs> They winter pretty well here. They are very difficult to manage. They're not for the average beekeeper. Mm -hmm. uh, they they would have a hard time managing them. But I mainly use hybrids. I use um, I use bees that are called VHS, which is Varroa hygienic sensitive. They're sensitive to Varroa mites, and they do some really strange stuff to keep the Varroa mites in check in their colonies. And I've had a lot of success with this because I do not treat put chemicals in my in my boxes for to treat for mites. Um, but there are, there are a lot of races. I mean, most people say they're Italian honeybees, but they've been broken down over the years with so many different types. There are mainly three and five banded Italians, but I use a lot of hybrids, which are crossbred. I crossbreed these, these VHS ones with my very hygienic survivor stock, and I get a cross out of that. I'm, I'm real pleased with it. Are any new, you mentioned, Bill, uh, a lot of the uh, other pollinators are dying off. Other bees and, and a small, smaller uh, micro or macro insects. Are any new, um, are any new insects actually uh, developing? Are we gaining any any new? I, I don't. The question was: Are, are, are any of the insects we're losing ground with insects? Are we uh, are we gaining anything back? I can't say with a hundred percent certainty, but I would say no. And if you don't think there's a war on insects, you can remember, maybe not John, yeah. but you can remember back when every time you put gas in your tank, you had to clean your windshield for all the bugs we had. Yeah. Uh, isn't that way anymore? <clears throat> it's a war on all bugs, but pollinators are taking the front. And you know, the sad part is we, we count colonies of bees and we monitor colonies of bees. We don't monitor a lot of these other insects. I can remember as a child, we had a camp in Forest County and the, the, the gnats, gnat hatch would be so thick. I'm not kidding, it would be this thick on a window that had light on it. The gnats were amazing. How, and it's, it's the bottom of the food chain for, for our amphibians, for all our other stuff, for birds, all this, they eat these things. And I won't tell you there aren't gnats up there anymore, but it isn't like it used to be. A lot of stuff is happening. We have really, really had a war with insects, and uh, it's it's mainly it's all in the name of, of more yield per acre, which um, it's a it's a it's a bad gamble. It's a, it's a wrong move. It really it's is. mainly because of a pesticides and other it, yeah, sprays. it's pesticides knocking them off. It's the way we farm. There's, there's a lot of things yeah. you know that affect it at all, but it's mainly these very very strong uh, pesticides. Great questions. That's a shame. Great questions.